You are listening to ESG News and Views from the Conference Board. Hello, this is Jeff Hoffman, Institute Leader of Corporate Citizenship and Philanthropy here at the Conference Board ESG Center. The ESG Center focuses on corporate citizenship, sustainability, and governance. This episode of ESG News and Views kicks off the first installment of our four series focusing on corporate citizenship in the Global South during COVID-19. This series will explore how emerging markets, Africa, Latin America, India, and the Middle East, which are now the epicenter of the pandemic, with daily infections now exceeding those in the United States and Europe. We are utilizing corporate resources and innovation as well as philanthropy to navigate this crisis. So we're going to learn from two of the experts. Today, we're focusing on how COVID-19 has impacted Africa, and I'm pleased to be joined by two fantastic guests. Dorcas Onango, Head of Sustainability for the Southern and East Africa Business Unit of the Coca-Cola Company and Ruth Lewin, Head of Corporate Sustainability for Discovery Limited, who are both based in South Africa. They will share their direct experience on the ground and how their businesses are providing critical support to their employees, first responders, and the nation. Welcome both. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you both. Appreciate having you with us today. So, Dorcas, um, let, let's start with with you. Um, we want to learn a little bit about you know what is happening across sub-Saharan Africa right now with the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic. We've been seeing um, in the news the rise of infection rates in different parts of of the continent, and I, I think it'll be important for us to know what is happening right now. Um, Jeff, so thank you for having me in the show, and I'm glad to be able to share what's happening in Africa. So um, Africa and Sub-Sahara specifically was expected to probably bear the worst of the brunt of the impact of COVID-19. What we've seen is that COVID-19 is yet to peak. However, we are seeing the effects, at least the social and economic effects have already taken place. South Africa and Cameroon have been the worst hit countries. Um, and even still, the, the caseload is increasing, uh, but not at the rate at which we feared. And, and we are grateful for that, but we are cautiously grateful as a continent. What we've seen, though, is that um, government took um, early precautionary measures to flatten the curve. Majority of the countries have been conscious that our health systems are relatively weak if you compare to Europe and the Americas. And so very early on, a lot of governments forced, were forced to take social distancing measures. Some locked down completely, like South Africa, or some instituted curfews. And this is where the socioeconomic impact is coming from. So uh, we will continue to monitor the disease, continue to be cautious. But what we are seeing is things like income and job losses. Majority of Africans in sub-Sahara Africa are employed in what we call vulnerable or informal sectors. And so when there's a lockdown and restricted movement, either they lose their jobs or they have to take really tough calls to choose between protecting their families and going to work. Otherwise, they don't earn. Um, And that has itself a lot of consequences. Food insecurity sets in very quickly for a family or people who earn a daily wage. When you don't earn, you cannot buy food and basic necessities. And of course, on a macro level, that means that economic growth begins to slow down, not just because the businesses have shut down, but livelihoods are at risk. And right now, the World Bank estimates that about $79 billion will be wiped out of the continent's um, uh, productivity and GDP, because not only are people not trading, uh, we've seen broken supply chains. About 25% of food that comes from outside of Africa may not be able to come into the continent. 7% of food availability may be lost through the fact that agriculture may not be able to continue as expected with restricted movements and broken supply chains for fertilizers and things like that. 
And then there's just, of course, things like um, Africa relies a lot on inflows from the diaspora or from direct investment or foreign aid that may not be able to come. And then lastly, of course, expenditures on our weak health systems to protect um, the society. So the negative economic downtown is already being felt, um, even though communities are trying to protect themselves. And that may actually make poverty worse than it is today. Now, coupled with that is one way out of poverty in Africa, obviously, is education and good health. But schooling has been interrupted, and in many parts of Africa, we don't have access to internet, um, certainly not for majority of the people. Um, and even where there's internet, there are instances where homeschooling is just not possible. Imagine if your parents or your gar- grandparents are taking care of you, um, either they're illiterate or they're literate, but you know they have to work. And so education, I think, is going to take a hit. Um, health as well. There are people with chronic diseases like diabetes and HIV, and we are seeing and hearing stories of people fearing to go to hospitals because um, they don't understand the disease or, you know, um, restricted movements. And so a whole lot of things are happening already on the socioeconomic front, as I mentioned. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I think one of the things that... Uh, you mentioned that uh, I have actually been reading quite a bit is, you know, the choices that, that people are, are having to make and is the the choice of either going to work or, or taking care of their families. And then the other aspect of it that you also uh, alluded to is, you know, the, the economic aspect. Um, and I, I've seen some reports that uh, there are concerns that there actually could you know, be more deaths from, uh, say, starvation because of of everything shutting down than the disease itself. Do you have any insights on that? I've read in, obviously, um, we're all in lockdown, but I've been reading media stories of people saying, you know, I fear dying of hunger than I fear dying of COVID-19 or We've seen um, stories of people who earn a very low level of income per day and without being able to go out there cannot earn and so they cannot um, buy food. Prior to the COVID in East Africa, we had been infested by locusts and there was already a threat um, uh, that there would be drought, which usually means that the cost of food is also going up. Um, So, yes, I think food insecurity is real, Um, and I haven't seen yet uh, concrete statistics about people who've actually lost their lives, but we do know that um, it's a problem, and it's it's, um, raising a lot of concerns with governments. In some countries like Uganda, when the lockdown was announced, immediately the first thing the government did was said that they would distribute food. We saw that in Rwanda as well because I think they understand these issues that um, I've mentioned already that would introduce food insecurity. Right. <clears throat> Thank you. No, that that's helpful. And, and it is always a you know, scary situation because, you know, you know, food is is one of those things that is is so critical. And I think is probably one of the first things that, uh, you know, when you're in a challenging situation, oftentimes people look at food as is comfort. And when you're choosing between, you know, uh, potentially being able to provide for your family and health considerations and the economic uh, issue around it, uh, you know, very, very challenging for people. So question now, how are companies beginning to uh, respond uh, to what's taking place, Dorcas? Um, so corporates, what I've seen and read in the media is that corporates and, and experience through partnerships uh, that Coca-Cola has formed with other corporates is huge level of concern and corporate citizenship. Uh, many Corporates, the first thing they did was to protect their employees um, by asking them to stay home and respect government um, restrictions on movement. And we did the same at Coca-Cola. We kept our businesses running by making sure our employees would be productive at home. 
because it's important for the economy to run. And when corporates are not running their businesses, what I just explained, loss of livelihoods and and earnings would would actually just accelerate the problem and the impact of COVID. In addition to that, most of them have gone out to make cash donations to NGOs and to governments or to leverage their core capabilities to support communities so that livelihoods and, li and lives are protected. In addition to just protecting the employees, protect the communities where they live. And this is something that a lot of corporates in Africa, including ourselves as Coca-Cola, we have a huge legacy in community giving. We are truly members of the community and, and, and I'm sure Ruth will say the same about our organization and we work together. We not, don't just do it on our own, but we understand the power of partnerships. And certainly that is a huge strategy for Coca-Cola. We are also seeing a number of organizations as part of their survival and contributing to economic recovery or sustaining the economic development is trying to innovate in order to limit the impact of COVID-19 um, and related disruptions that have impacted uh, economies and supply chains. So we've seen a lot of online selling and digital platforms. Uh, and we're certainly doing that in our company at Coca-Cola, looking at how e-commerce can be a new channel so that we can continue to make sure communities are hydrated. And a lot of other companies obviously would do the same along the value chain. So we are focused on making meaningful and impact actions for our employees, but also for the communities where we operate. And of course, we do take care of our stakeholders. In our case, we look at all the players in our value chain, not just ourselves, and try to determine um, the difficulties that they're going in and how do we contribute some of our strategies if not help them directly. So there's a very collaborative spirit across Africa amongst governments, NGOs, and corporates. Now, <clears throat> Dorcas, that's so great to hear. And, uh, you know, as you have referenced, the Coca-Cola company has been uh, on the African continent for a very, very long time and very engaged. And you have some uh, really incredible programs through your foundation on water and girls and education, et cetera. And you mentioned, you know, the importance of, of hydration. Uh, can you tell us just a little bit more about specifically what the Coca-Cola Foundation um, is doing? Sure. Um, so, yes, we've been in the continent as a company for 90 years out of the 134 years that Coca-Cola has been in existence. And we have a legacy of supporting communities. Our corporate foundation every year donates 1% of its uh, profit before tax towards community support programs, which we implement through philanthropy. So we built on that experience. We were able to anticipate the depth and the breadth of how COVID-19 might affect um, societies and communities and the economies. And across Africa, we've donated about 17 million as a system, out of which 4 million has come for philanthropic efforts from the Coca-Cola Foundation. And these amounts of money are being disbursed through NGOs that we work with, such as Red Cross, who are experienced working in communities and will use these funds to support needy and vulnerable community members, especially in urban settlements where we feared the epicenter of the disease might be. To provide things like food parcels, cash transfers, there may be communities where we may not be able to reach them physically, but as a company that's been here for long and understands how communities are affected in terms of strife, in terms of suffering, in times of suffering like now, we understand the different mechanisms. So there might be cash transfers like in places like Lesotho where communities are highly dispersed, but they need support. Um, we've distributed soap, water, and sanitizer and hand washing facilities, which the WHO had recommended as the first line of defense for hygiene promotion to fight COVID-19. We are working with an NGO called AMREF in Kenya to fumigate public spaces. And we've also helped some countries at a macro level. We are helping governments to purchase uh, personal protective equipment, uh, provide training for community health workers, just so that their basic health system at the community level, which is very important in sub-Sahara Africa, can support those who might contract the disease. Um, but what we do through our Africa Foundation is philanthropic 
and really just on a humanitarian level. However, we understand how far communities might need to be helped. So we've also put in our own business expertise. Uh, we are leveraging our capabilities in different ways. We were able to use extra production cap capabilities in Ethiopia and Uganda to help government bridge the difference between the demand and supply for sanitizers. And we produced and, and supplied sanitizers for free to hospitals, communities, and employees. We've used our trucks to transport these sanitizers, uh, uh, PPEs and care kits, food parcels and beverages um, to communities across countries. Uh, for example, in Southeast Africa Business Unit where we operate, we have 13 countries and in every of those countries where possible, we use our logistics capabilities to support ourselves and other organizations to make sure whatever was donated can be distributed. Um, we've also simplified and we've helped the governments to simplify and amplify public health messages. As you know, Africa is very diverse. Um, a country like Kenya, where I come from, has 42 languages. And when it comes to public health, you are as strong as the weakest link. And so we wanted to help governments make sure the important messaging about hygiene protection and, pro and safety reached every single person. So we, we helped either by providing our real estate uh, sorry, our paid up uh, marketing real estate. In some instances, we provided technical assistance. How do you translate the language to certain community members as we are doing in Swaziland, where the government wanted to talk to rural communities and particularly those who already are afflicted by HIV. How do we bring that message home in a way that doesn't dilute already existing public messages? In certain instances like Ethiopia, where the, camp, the country speaks largely Amharic? How do we translate public health messages? So we've worked very closely with governments to simplify and amplify public health messages as a foundation for anything else that might be done. And then of course, there are countries like South Africa which needed a different type of help. Um, different countries in Africa are at a different level of organization and development. South Africa is very well organized and the government came to create rallied everybody, corporate, civil society, individuals, um, to come together and create a solidarity fund so that there would be one point of contact that would look at all facets that were required to contain the disease, given that this country was the most at risk in Africa. And so we donated a million dollars as the Coca-Cola company to South Africa's solidarity fund to join the rest of the country. And the solidarity fund has been able to do amazing things They've responded with huge needs. For example, they've bought ventilators, they're training health workers, they're ensuring that there's food distributed, they're ensuring that um, PPEs are distributed. So it's a very well integrated and coordinated national effort that also includes uh, communication and public health messaging amongst many other things. Um, and we've seen that South Africa has been able to contain the rate of spread of the disease. And I believe it's because the, the country was able to come together as a unit led by the president and supported by companies such as ourselves. Um, and then of course, as I said earlier on, you know, I think the response to COVID would be easier in any country where in any case, social and economic issues have been addressed in the past. So. Being in Africa over 90 years, we've always supported communities to protect themselves. There are two areas where we are particularly active in the last couple of years. One is access to clean water. And we've seen that that's the first defense for any public um, health protection. So we have a program called Replenish Africa Initiative that's been run in all countries in Africa through an investment of $65 million in the last 10 years, we committed to bringing access to clean water to 6 million people. And by today, we've reached 5 million people. And you can imagine, Jeff, how long it takes to reach 5 million people if COVID happened and governments and organizations like ourselves were not invested already in improving access to clean water. So we are building on legacy programs. And this also, as I said earlier, gave us the insights to be able to anticipate the needs of communities because we operate in communities anyway. We are also involved in a different way. We've been working for many years to strengthen health systems in Africa. 
We are in partnership with USAID, the development aid arm of the US government, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and Global Fund. These are the top agencies across the world when it comes to health, um, aside from WHO. And I've partnered with Coca-Cola to transfer our knowledge of doing business in Africa to governments so that whatever it is that drives our success in distribution and marketing and supply chain is what governments can also use to make sure that health services can reach the last mile. So, yeah, I think I've given you a comprehensive update uh, and I'd be happy to take other questions. But you can imagine, Jeff, what I'm saying without partnerships, without leveraging not just finances, but our capabilities we would not be able to make an impact in the way that we are. And, and I think what I'm talking about is just one phase, what we call the outbreak phase. We'll be looking at other phases because corona may not with, be with us forever, but certainly it seems like it might be with us a little bit longer than anyone would have wanted. Yeah, <clears throat> Dorcas, thank you so much. Uh, you know, extremely impressive work from the Coca-Cola company, the Coca-Cola Foundation. And and I think you're right, it's very evident how you can take the legacy programs uh, and then tailor them to meet what, uh, you know, the current needs are. And then also on, on top of that is very evident that you're, how you're utilizing your core competencies as a, a company, your products, your distribution distribution system, et cetera, to really meet the needs during this pandemic. So, uh, wow, very, very, very impressive. Uh, you mentioned South Africa. Uh, you mentioned collaborations, et cetera. And I think uh, it's time to, ta uh, to turn the conversation to Ruth uh, with Discovery Limited. Uh, Ruth is based in South Africa as well as Discovery Limited is which is a uh, multinational corporation that is based in South Africa. And I think Ruth is going to be looking at it from the point of, you know, the headquarters is, is in Africa and how it's looking out at the world, uh, which is kind of a different direction from the Coca-Cola company and how it's also a multinational company. And what you were talking about is one region uh, <coughs> of the world that uh, Coca-Cola operates in. So Ruth, specifically from uh, your viewpoint, at your corporate headquarters in South Africa, what are you seeing? Thank you very much for the opportunity, Jeff. Um, um, Dorcas has provided a really good context for both the continent and South Africa, so I'm not going to repeat it, except that I would like to raise the fact that we are very much in the early stages of the coronavirus, and so I think the um, the responses both from government um, and the corporate sector has been um, uh, quite um, uh, phenomenal, actually, in terms of how we're going to cope in the, the months um, to come. Um, if I could just situate the actual um, disease at the moment, uh, we've got over 73,000 or approximately 73,533 people infected at the moment. We have 1,568 COVID-related deaths, um, to date representing a mortality rate of about 2.1%. We have over a million tests conducted to date, and we have 39,867 recoveries. Um, as Dorcas so uh, eloquently put, you know, this has been an amazing response from both government and the corporate sector um, and broadly civil society. And when we look at how at the quick response of government to the, um, in, in terms of the lockdown on the 26th or roundabout day of March, we saw real benefits being derived from, from such um, a, a response. One being um, that, you know, if you look at the kind of high a rate of violence and gangsterism in the country. We saw um, gangs getting together and um, and having a national ceasefire within the first few weeks of the lockdown. Um, we immediately, as a result of that and other in, and other um, uh, you know kind of interventions, we saw the overall homicide rate falling by seventy percent in the first week. 
the ban on the sale of alcohol um, in a country that has the highest consumption of alcohol on the on the African continent had a huge positive impact on the number of trauma cases, which dropped by two thirds. You know, all of these interventions really assisted the health system to cope with the with the key impact of the coronavirus. There was an 81% drop in road accidents over the Easter weekend because of the curfews largely um, through the lockdown. We had um, a government implementing a stronger safety net in terms of welfare and business support to the value of about $26 billion, the equivalent to 10% of, of GDP. And that relief package is projected to increase in the next 18 months to approximately $46 billion. Thousands of health workers were deployed to conduct nationwide door-to-door screening operations. Um, you know, we also have a very sophisticated medical research infrastructure and resources which are being invested to give specific attention to the data around the epidemiology of the virus. Um, you know, Dorcas referred to solidarity funds, so I won't raise that again. And I think it's in this context that the private sector could make its contribution. And so I'd like to just focus on that. As discovery, and we are a global, as you mentioned, a global insurance um, uh, company, um, we were, you know, our core purpose completely talks to our response, making people healthier and enhancing and protecting lives. Um, this was an apt opportunity for us to show how alive our core purpose is in terms of our response to our people, the, meaning the discovery employees, our members, our clients, in other words, and broader society. And, you know, we quickly organize ourselves globally in terms of these key principles. In terms of our discovery employees, our focus was on keeping our employees safe and making sure that we are unified, even though spatially we are separated. Um, by the end of March, we had, which was just at the start of the lockdown, 80% of discovery people, that amounts to almost 9,000 people, were working from home and very efficiently working from home. Um, the other 20% were working in the office. Um, we saw that webinars were held every day for the first two months um, at 2 p.m. for one hour. So it was a set time in which people could get together uh, virtually. We were running about 35,000 video sessions and calls per day. And to our customer base, we were very clear. The battle cry in the business was business as usual. All of Discovery was mobilized in that we were open for business and we were providing essential services. And our mission essentially was to protect vulnerable communities in our customer base by rolling out a number of products. And I'll talk to that um, a little bit um, later. Um, and so in terms of the country, you know, our, our support through the Solidarity Fund, which fund which Dorcas referred to, uh, provided support for SMMEs, and it became the fund became the, the bedrock of, of jobs and, and job creation and entrepreneurship, and it, all of it was about how do we help the sector to survive. Similarly, the Solidarity Fund, um, as Dorcas um, referred to, was about providing PPEs to to our public health um, facilities so that those workers at the front line could be protected. Our values as discovery also was kind of paramount in the way in which we responded. It was all about our values, talk to optimism, innovation, prudence, and elect intellectual leadership. And everything was galvanized around that. So it was about the innovation of products uh, in terms of our COVID-19 response. Um, you know, providing packaged meals to employees who are working from the office. Um, we found that many employees were now suddenly faced with not having access to public transport due to the lockdown. And through our insurance, our, our short-term insurance business, we mobilized car rental car vehicles where hundreds of vehicles overnight started filling the parking bays in our building to ensure that our employees could get to work and home safely. So, you know, that really talked to, to kind of the urgency of the matter. Then there were kind of three clear unusuals, which, um, which, 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 
you know, explain the environment within which we were working and how we were collaborating and innovating. And that was one, we moved from this great physical office environment which we have to a series of Zoom meetings. We were completely virtual and thousands were working from home. The intensity with which we were working was another unusual you know, where we would in the past worked in monthly cycles, we moved to weekly, daily, and hourly cycles. Our exco uh, was was meeting, who used to meet on a weekly basis, was now meeting on a daily basis. Our our purpose became so real, and and we were driven towards being a true force for social good. So, how did this actually manifest in terms of the responses? We quickly adapted our business um, to support clients and the healthcare system. Um, So, you know, because we are also a medical health insurance company, we could respond um, very clearly to that. And and for our members, we we introduced over 30 products and benefit updates across our businesses to respond to a greater need for resilience, affordability and value in a post-COVID-19 world. We we understood the challenging operating and financial environment in which all Discovery clients may find themselves during this time. And the group immediately introduced a range of options to support vulnerable groups by offering flexibility in premium payments to ensure they can continue with their cover. Early in March already, soon after lockdown, um, or just before lockdown, the Discovery Health Medical Scheme developed the Discovery Health Medical Scheme World Health Organization Global Outbreak Benefit, which was immediately accessible to members on all medical plans. And this benefit essentially provides risk benefits for COVID-19 screening, testing, and treatment. And all our policyholders of Discovery's low-income health insurance product called Discovery Primary Care, have access to full funding for testing and treatment costs for confirmed COVID-19 cases. Any waiting periods in place for current Discovery Gap um, uh, cover policyholders are being waived to fund valid COVID-19 claims. So, you know, we took away a lot of the kind of anxiety which our members would have gone through during this period by, by, by by responding quickly and by responding to a situation which we knew our members would find themselves in. In terms of health care, the Discovery Fund, which is, uh, which is the, the, um, the CSI element of, of our work, the philanthropy part, donated 2 million rand to Gift of the Givers. It's a relief um, NGO that operates throughout the country and, in fact, on the continent as a whole um, for use in procuring and distributing PPEs to non-governmental organizations. In fact, what we did with many, we, we fund on a multi-year um, basis we uh, about 40 organizations and we immediately sent out communication to all of them saying that they could redirect the funding which we had already given them towards COVID-19. And we found that this was received in a, in a very, very um, positive light that we actually made this possible. And many of the organizations did exactly that. All our healthcare professionals, who are also members of Discovery Health Medical Scheme, um, were, were also provided influenza, influenza vaccination, which was fully funded. Um, understanding the difficult time that our doctor community was, was facing, the Discovery Healthy Company, uh, which is the group's employee wellness and employee assistance offering, opened its platform for emotional and financial well-being assistance. Um, and this has now been open for all doctors to access as well. And um, it, it's been completely um, uh, very welcomely received by, by the community um, and oversubscribed. In terms of our small, medium enterprises, the Discovery Health Medical Scheme has set aside approximately 2.3 billion rand from its reserves to provide contribution concessions to qualifying small and medium businesses that are affected by the COVID-19 outbreak. And we particularly saw this in the dentist community, that they would all have to close for a period um, as they were so vulnerable um, to this disease. And so this offers qualifying employers with less than 200 employees a concession to defer up to two months of medical scheme contributions for their employees. 
no interest is charged on the contributions deferred, and the concession is effective immediately. And we found that this will help to provide support for more than 600,000 Discovery Health uh, Medical Scheme members. Discovery also partnered with clothing and textile, te textile manufacturers to produce high-quality Discovery fabric face masks, according to NICD, which is our National Institute of uh, Communicable Diseases Guidelines. And these masks are available to redeem from, you know, top retailers in the country, um, a pharmaceutical, a, a pharmacy a group, um, etc. We've also created vehicles for members to contribute towards. So, for example, the Solidarity Fund, members have made um, substantial contribu contributions towards that. Yeah, I'm not sure whether you want to ask any other questions, Jeff. <laughs> no, I, you know, Ruth, that is <clears throat> incredible. What you said to me that really uh, struck me was, you know, when your purpose became so real, you know, being a force for social good and, and the power of your business model really coming uh, to life, which I think is, is so important. Um, we do want to get to questions, but I, I would like for you to talk uh, just a second about collaboration and uh, what you have been doing with Vodacom. Yeah. So one of the offerings um, that we made, and we extended it way beyond our members um, to broader society, was that we realized that, you know, a whole lot of people would need to have access to, to doctors and to consultations with doctors but that this wasn't possible physically. And so th with Vodacom, we instituted or, or partnered with them to bring um, to, to do 100,000 consultations or to make 100,000 consultations available countrywide, uh, virtual consultations, by the way. Um, and this has also been, um, uh, been well received um, by the broader South African community. And we thought this was a really, really innovative way of giving people access to healthcare. And, you know, again, I think that's a great example of not only two companies coming together, but two companies coming together that have complementary core competencies and products working together to provide services for the community. So uh, <clears throat> thanks for telling us a little bit about this. Um, in, in our remaining time, uh, just want to cover one thing with uh, the two of you, um, and that's your employees. We talked about uh, you know, what you as companies have been doing for your employees, the concern, et cetera, but I would love to hear a little bit more about what your employees have been doing for the communities. I mean, you both have good employee volunteer programs, um, in many cases, award-winning employee volunteer programs. Uh, so. Uh, could you both uh, tell us a little bit about how your employees are, are actually helping during the pandemic? Yeah, so maybe if I could kick off, um, Jeff. I mean, we've had to be quite, have to be nimble quite quickly. Um, and it wasn't an easy task. You know, in previous months, our virtual volunteerism accounted for less than 1% of our overall volunteer activities. And as you said, we've got a very active volunteer um, a, a, a cohort within Discovery. Um, considering the pandemic and the difficulties there of, you know, having people working from their homes, this average has increased significantly, with 35% of our volunteers virtually supporting organizations in the following ways. We've had um, uh, employees developing business documents and proposals for NPOs, not for profits in the country. Um, design thinking, virtual men mentorship has taken off in a very big way within the business. Um, volunteers within Discovery um, have approached the, the um, employee volunteer program team, that's the team within my area, indicating their interest in providing design thinking workshops to learners in order to improve their problem-solving abilities. And we know that the majority of children in our country don't have access to good quality education. So having these enhanced services is going to really assist um, um, those learners. 
our actuarial staff, you know, being an insurance company, we we with, rich with actuaries. And our actuarial staff have previously provided a series of face-to-face workshops to provide maths tutoring. In light of the pandemic, volunteers have been encouraged to record videos in a range of subjects which will be made accessible to schools. So to date, we actually have approximately 60 videos which have been uploaded in maths and information technology. And as a business committed to positive, healthy behavior, uh, you know, we incentivize healthy behavior, whether it is within the short-term insurance or in the health insurance. And so in, to this, uh, you know, in the same context, we've, we've, um, we've committed to positive, healthy behavior through our Discovery Vitality RSA team, uh, which, was, which has developed healthy meal and exercise plans for distribution to adopted organizations. Um, it's the same kind of of of, um, of uh, support which we've been given our members. You know, our members would generally go into gyms to exercise, and they would be incentivized for doing so. Now we are providing virtual um, gym uh, uh, programs, which they can access from the comfort of their homes. And in the same way, our healthy studio has been um, has been providing. Uh, Recipes for healthy meals, and 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 we are we are continuing the incentivizing program in that regard. In 2018, um, in partnership with a big bank in South Africa, ABSA and the Kingdom of the Netherlands, that's the Netherlands Embassy and the City of Johannesburg, we established a business center to support youth in Orange Farm. Orange Farm is an is an informal settlement um, 40 kilometers from the center of Johannesburg. Um, and in establishing uh, and maintaining businesses in that area. And the center is managed by a local um, business um, NGO called Township Flavor, who already had a footprint in the area prior to establishing a relationship with Discovery. Now, as an extension of volunteerism, various departments within Discovery were invited to provide master classes in the area of expertise to these 40 entrepreneurs uh, which are being incubated by Township Flavor. So that's another another way of, of, of virtual volunteerism um, that has been implemented. And then under the guidance of the head of our Center for Clinical Excellence in our Discovery Health um, medical insurance business, we've developed an educational video on effective prevention of COVID-19 for the distribution to schools in, in the poorer areas. Several staff in our digital channels have um, uh, um, have participated in a global hackathon to develop a solution for COVID-19. Um, and then, you know, we've also leveraged off our own capabilities to enhance service delivery around sanitation tunnels, PPEs, et cetera, for NGOs. We, we for example, found that one of our healthcare um, uh, NGOs in a rural area had put up these sanitation tunnels. And the World Health Organization has certainly warned against these tunnels not being particularly safe uh, when one is spraying, um, uh, you know, disinfectant onto people. And so one of our, our head of clinical, um, of clinical excellence in Discovery Health could immediately advise the NGO that they should take this down and dismantle it and not use it um, because of, of, of fears around safety. That is so impressive, uh, what you were doing with your volunteer program, Ruth, uh, just just a big uh, wow. I mean, so, so great. Again, taking your employees, you know, what their core competencies are, the training programs for others, the communities, um, you know, it, just very impressive. Thank you. So, Dorcas, anything you would like to add on the employee volunteering piece or any parting comments before we conclude our podcast today? Sure. Uh, um, We also are very proud of our employees. Um, They stayed home when they needed to stay home. And as you know, uh, our business is huge in Africa. We are in every country and almost everywhere. So what we do makes a huge difference when we do the right thing by staying home when they were required to and only those who were needed going out, that in itself set the tone uh, for other people who want to do the right thing. But also our employees requested to make personal 
um, cash and in-kind contributions. And this is because it's a reflection of who we are as a company. Making a difference is in our DNA and our employees, in addition to knowing that we were spending about $17 million across the continent, wanted to personally be a part of uh, making a difference. And we enabled them as a company, as we always do, by matching them to NGOs to whom their contributions would make a difference that the company uh, works with. But we also supported their contributions through matching contributions. So we have an employee matching program. Some of our bottlers, for example, in South Africa have what you call the soul fund, where employees come together and they donate food and in-kind um, donations. They assist each other as employees if one of them has problems, but also donate to their immediate communities. Um, but also, as I mentioned earlier, Project Last Mile being the health system strengthening uh, partnership that we have with leading health organizations is working in 10 countries. And in those 10 countries, when we transfer our business acumen, it's not just a direct transfer. Literally, what we look at is our marketing supply chain capabilities and how we operate in business. And we, we sometimes work with organizations that help to transfer that from our own employees into the government um, environment. So as you can imagine, the expertise lies with the, within our organization, but there is a transfer process that helps governments, for example, in Eswatini, where the government asked us specifically to help them communicate with young ladies. We are using our marketing expertise um, to try and communicate to young girls who are at risk of HIV. And normally our marketing expertise talks to young people. And, and that directly you can see how what our employees do is, happens in government to make a difference through assistance of other organizations. But lastly, also in uh, West Africa, under the auspices of an um, employee volunteering program called Coke Cares, we launched a food support program to celebrate 134 years of existence of the Coca-Cola company. And our employees went out and supported 134 vulnerable families living in small urban communities uh, in a place called Yaba in Lagos. And this continues. Um, so a total of about 161 families eventually received food supplies for a week. And about 100 more beneficiaries living in the community will receive food packs in a couple of days. So our employees are really, for us, the core of, 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 of what happens. Those who went out to continue to sell, we saw them within the company as part of our frontline workers, making sure there's hydration for policemen, for frontline health workers, for hospitals, wherever it was needed. They took the risk along with other frontline uh, uh, workers. So... In closing, let me put it this way, that we've been in Africa for 90 years, and I've talked about some of what we've done in the outbreak phase, but we saw this as something that will continue. So in the coming days and going forward, we also want to contribute to economic recovery. So you will see us support micro and small businesses who are the fabric of communities in Africa, livelihoods in Africa through small shops and people who own small businesses. We've got waste reclaimers in our value chain who we already um, distributed food to because they were not classified as essential service providers, but they, they needed to survive because when the economy opens, these people play a critical role in our, in our societies. So we are planning to support small uh, traders in our value chain, be they farmers, be they traders, be they waste reclaimers. And we will be working with governments and other organizations. Already in Kenya, we know we will work with Diageo and ABSA, uh, which is a bank, to make sure that small traders have um, safety measures they need to continue to operate. They have marketing campaigns that can create demand so that their businesses can operate. Um, and that they are linked to other partners who may provide them with other services um, that they need. So, um, yes, we've donated money, we've leveraged our, sisters, our system and expertise, we've leveraged our partnerships, and we've been working in a phased approach to make sure that not only our employees, communities, and stakeholders are supported, but that the economy can continue to run, because we understand that it's the backbone of Africa's resilience. 
Yeah, <clears throat> so true. And making a difference, uh, as you said, is certainly in your DNA. So, uh, you know, Dorcas, uh, the Coca-Cola company, and Ruth, uh, Discovery Limited, thank you both so much. And thank you to our listeners. For more content on COVID-19, please visit our resource hub at uh, conference-board.org backslash COVID hyphen 19 uh, and stay tuned for our next installment of corporate citizenship in the global south during COVID-19 which is part of the conference board's ESG news and views thank you so much for listening today stay safe and stay healthy this has been ESG news and views from the conference board